I'm Peter Sinclair. My background is in uh, graphics and communication. I've been a cartoonist, a syndicated cartoonist. I've been an animator. And about six years ago, uh, while uh, the economy was kind of collapsing in my local area and my business was going south, I decided as long as I kind of had nothing to do, I might as well do something that I thought was worthwhile. And uh, I had been deeply, deeply angry having followed the climate issue for, uh, since the early 1980s. Um, uh, I was deeply, furiously angry at what was going on with the disinformation we were seeing, particularly on the internet. I felt the scientists uh, were, were at a disadvantage on the internet uh, because uh, most of them just simply didn't, don't know how to fight with the kind of ferocity with which they were being attacked. Uh, but I felt that I had enough uh, technical understanding as kind of a, a, a science geek from an early age and uh, as a, a, a presenter at that time with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. I had met a number of actual climate scientists who were my mentors and I uh, began to develop my own pr presentation materials which morphed into this YouTube series called Climate Denial Croc of the Week. Uh, the climate crocs, I assume you're all familiar with the American idiom when you know what a croc is. Uh, the climate crocs are these crunchy little nuggets of disinformation that someone on the radio can say in 15 seconds, uh, but it literally takes uh, Stephen Ramsdorf or Mike Mann an hour and a half to tease them apart uh, and actually make sense of them. Uh, and these things, this is, this is deliberate, these things are crafted in uh, PR firms and think tanks in Washington and New York and LA, and they're specifically meant to go out there and confuse and uh, uh, confuse the dialogue, because uh, the, the, the model is the tobacco industry. Doubt is our product. If we can create that doubt in people's mind, we can freeze the policy dialogue, we can slow things down, we can keep this uh, gravy train of fossil fuels going. Uh, so uh, there are more than 100 videos in this series uh, which, uh, and over the last uh, couple years, I've started another series for the Yale Forum on Climate Change in the Media called This Is Not Cool. And this one uh, is a little bit more devoted to uh, not so much worrying about the disinformation as explaining the science as it evolves and talking uh, more and more to the wider and wider circle of scientists who have become my contacts and my friends uh, over the last few years. Uh, Stefan and Mike have done a really great job with the science and I don't pretend to uh, 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 add too much to what they say, but uh, I, have, I have better pictures. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put a few of those up. Um, we talked about sea ice. We don't have the September numbers yet, but we know that 2012 was this giant crash of sea, sea ice. This is what it looked in August uh, and, and of course uh, we didn't set a new record. We set a new record last year. We didn't set a new record this year. So uh, predictably, what we see is um, a, you know, a celebration on the climate denial side. Why? The ice is coming back. The world must be getting colder. You know? And this is, this is, we see this like literally every year. And you can, you can count on this. This will, be, this will go on until the ice completely disappears. Um, but. Uh, Let's just look at it a little bit uh, more closely. It's, it is a bit frustrating that uh, a news item like this, and this is quite a, quite a few weeks ago, 160,000 shares already. So uh, this has crept into the media dialogue, even though it's utter nonsense. This is the, the graphic that goes along with it. And you can see the 2012 uh, sea ice minimum. You can see the 2013 sea ice minimum. But this is area. This is area of ice, OK? The National Snow and Ice uh, Data Center defines, or ex, uh, the National Snow and Ice uh, Data Center defines the extent of ice as uh, any as, as the area where there is 15 percent or more uh, of ice cover. Uh, but a more useful way to look at it is not just the area, but the actual thickness of the ice, because as dramatic as the loss of area has been, the loss of volume. Uh, has been even much more dramatic over the last 40 years. So let me set this up for you. This is an animation, and this was created at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. It's color-coded. So this is winter 1987. 
here's the Arctic, Alaska, Canada, Greenland, uh, Iceland, <laughs> Iceland must be somewhere over there, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, Russia, Siberia, and so here's the North Pole. The white stuff, the whitest of the white stuff is the thickest ice, more than nine years old, okay? And so that is the ice that's been around for many, many years. It's made it through many, many summers. It's really, really thick. It's really, in some cases, very old. And it, it's so massive that it holds that uh, ice cap or that ice sheet together. And um, it also insulates that 32 degree ocean water from the air overhead. So uh, in these vast areas, that air can get really, really, really cold. Okay, so this is 30 years ago. So now we'll start the animation and you'll see it freezing and thawing. Freezing and thawing as we go through the years here. So you'll see summer, winter, summer, winter, and look at the perennial ice. See what it's doing. It is going away. Okay, so uh, every year there is less and less of this multi year ice, and there's more and more of this one year ice. That, that freezes out in the winter, but then melts completely away in the summer. So that ice is getting more and more fragile, more and more subject to melt. And as we get up in 2007, boom, big ice loss. This will take us up to 2011. So this isn't, doesn't even get us to the record low of 2012. But you can see what's happening is the perennial ice is going away. And as a result, we're losing a tremendous amount of volume. Here's another way to visualize it. This is volume 1979. This is volume 2012. And really hasn't changed significantly in the last year. Um, another way to look at it is uh, here's uh, some graphics from this year, August, from the University of Frankfurt. And you can see how the, this ice really kind of looks like Swiss cheese up here. It's so thin, so fragile, big holes in it up by the North Pole. And it's really kind of an accident of the winds that this whole section, this kind of Swiss cheesy section here, didn't just drift off and blow away and melt. So it, it, it is a chance occurrence, uh, mostly governed by random events and winds, uh, whether, whether or not we had uh, a uh, uh, relative recovery this year, not a new record year, as opposed to yet another deep uh, record, another shocking low. It's just, just random chance. And uh, the ice is now so fragile that uh, uh, your, your, your ice scientists are telling me, I, I talked to uh, Walt Meyer, one of the leading scientists at the American National Snow and Ice Data Center, uh, who said to me just a few months ago, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I never imagined that in my lifetime I would see open water in the <coughs> Arctic Ocean. Now I'm quite sure that I will. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's probably in his 40s. So, uh, you know, he's expecting it sometime in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. That's pretty much the mainstream. Uh, that's where the smart money is uh, right now. And we could see it even a lot sooner, sooner if we did see a perfect storm of conditions uh, like we've seen in some of these record low years. Um, so another, another uh, objection that you'll hear from climate deniers is, well, uh, that satellite data only goes back to 1979. So how can we possibly know uh, what the ice was doing uh, more than 30 years ago? And I heard this from someone at the Heartland Institute meeting, someone that should know better, uh, just a, a couple years ago. Uh, but in fact, we do know because we have data that is based on uh, the <coughs> samples of the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, where if you look at the sediment, the sediment that's under ice is different from sediment that's under open water because there's different types of creatures that live in those two different environments. And so when we, when we look at that, we have a paper from just a couple years ago uh, that shows that going back 1,450 years that the sea ice was basically kind of toddling along, more or less stable, until the last 150 years or so when it dropped off precipitously. This is a reverse hockey stick, okay? And so to look at this graph and then to, to say it looks like this year we will have, uh, it looks like the sixth 
lowest extent of ice in the last 400, 1,450 years. Uh, that is not what we would define as some dramatic recovery in Arctic ice. So don't, uh, don't let anyone uh, give you that particular one. Um, there's, another, there's another one going around out there uh, that you'll hear that, oh, well, the ice is shrinking at the North Pole, but it's growing at the South Pole, okay? Well, I, I did a video on that, too, and you can Google Peter Sinclair, Yale, Arctic versus Antarctic ice, and you can see interviews with all the appropriate scientists on that one. But long story short, um, this is the graph. This is the uh, most credible graph of global sea ice from the University of Illinois, Cryosphere Today. You can, you can Google it. You can go there. It's very easy to find. And uh, what you see here is here's the ice up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down since uh, 1979, winter, summer, winter, summer. Uh, and then here's the actual uh, global extent. So this is north and south. The north has been shrinking on the average about 11% per decade for the last 30 or 40 years. The south has been growing at about 1% per decade during that time. And we know pretty much why, because the winds are kind of changing around the South Pole and they're sort of they're spreading that ice out just a, a tiny bit. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah it's kind of sort of setting some, some uh, new extent records, but those records are, are very tiny, they're very small, and it is uh, the global amount of ice, sea ice, is, is uh, without a doubt uh, collapsing uh, based on the, the overwhelming losses that we're seeing in the north. Now, uh, a couple of uh, current climate crocs that we're seeing in the buildup to the IPCC rollout, which just happened uh, in the last week, uh, is this idea of a warming plateau. We're told that there's a pause in global warming, and I think Stefan did a nice job of explaining this uh, on the graph. You can see it's mostly, it's a cherry pick, it's, a, it's an artifact based on that gigantic El Nino event we had in 1988-1999, right? And, but uh, uh, the, the climate deniers are very good. They have been uh, obviously prepping for this for a long time. They have seeded this through the media over the last six months or so, that there's this pause, there's a flattening. Uh, the scientists don't know how to explain it. Oh my god. Uh, uh, and uh, so um, this has become kind of a standard framing for a lot of the journalists in reporting on the IPCC, unfortunately. So uh, point for them, OK, we get it. Um, but you know, in fact, uh, we know uh, what this is all about. Because if you look at the actual temperature record, uh, it, is, it is not monotonic. Uh, you can see that it's, it's flat or it's cooling all the time, except when it's not. Uh, because uh, because uh, there is variability, there is randomness, and this is easy to understand if you're willing to understand it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, what what uh, the climate denialist goal is not to be right, it's not to be accurate, it is to confuse the dialogue. Okay. And, and, and this is not to say this is true of your neighbor who, you know, heard something on the radio and he doesn't believe any of this nonsense. You know, that's an innocent person who's just been, uh, he's one of the victims. Uh, I'm talking about the people who are at the top, who, who really are bright enough to know better and probably do know better. Uh, but nevertheless, it is their professional uh, uh, vocation, because many of them are sociopaths, uh, to, uh, to uh, to push back, to confuse, to, to deliberately muddy this issue. And uh, you know, someday uh, there's, there are many uh, uh, master's theses in psychology yet to be written on, on this topic. So you know, get at it. Um, OK, so we know that global warming has not stopped. The warming of the globe continues because we can measure it. We can measure how much is coming in, how much is getting out. We've got satellites that do it. They do it very accurately, and there is an energy imbalance, meaning uh, uh, there's a differential there. And that differential is large. It is not small. In fact, it is equivalent to approximately the same energy of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs exploding every day, 365 days a year. 
Most of that energy goes into the ocean by far. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, 93 plus percent of it goes into the ocean. Stefan can speak to this much more uh, credibly than I can, but this is the figure. So, uh, important to understand that the, mi the minor, uh, the fluctuations that we see in the surface temperature record uh, can, can, can vary wildly with just a, a tiny uh, a change in the way that the ocean is processing uh, the absorption of heat. And this is something we're still learning an awful lot about, but we have a, a system of uh, floats, little devices, like buoys, called Argo floats. There are 3,000 of them around the planet, distributed through the oceans, and they, they dive down, they find out uh, information about temperature and salinity and currents, they come back up and they broadcast it, and we're gradually developing a better understanding of how that works. And what we're kind of getting right now is that uh, uh, we seem to be in a period where the planet is uh, pulling more energy into the deeper layers of the ocean. So it's not quite showing up as strongly on our surface thermometers. But we know it's there. We know it's there because it's melting ice. It's melting uh, uh, not only uh, sea ice, but it is melting ice in Antarctica and Greenland. We can see uh, that that's happening. So uh, I was debating one of these, um, one of the more well-known of these uh, uh, climate deniers a few years ago, and he had kind of a, a laugh line, which was, uh, how do you tell the temperature of a planet? Where do you stick the thermometer? And if you think about it, it's a, not a bad question. Um, because uh, we all know what a thermometer is. A thermometer is a vessel of a known capacity, and it's filled with a fluid of a known volume, right? And when you put it under your tongue or in baby's bottom, it warms up, right? Fluid warms up, and it expands, OK? And then we read that expansion, and we, we see that as an analog for temperature, right? OK. So that's what a thermometer is. Well. The ocean is a vessel of known capacity. It is filled with a fluid of a known volume. And we're warming it up. So we would expect it to expand. And indeed, it is. Uh, we measure that expansion in uh, terms of sea level rise. And Stefan also talked about this. And he probably showed you this graph. But um, here it is. We see dramatic sea level rise, yet another hockey stick. Uh, especially over the last 150 years or so. This is a measure of the heat that is going into the ocean, causing that fluid to expand, causing sea level rise. You absolutely cannot get away from global warming when you look at this graph. And when you see uh, that over the last uh, 20 years or so with the satellite record, which is especially accurate, uh, that is, is practically just uh, nailed uh, with very little variation. There's a little bit of a La Nina blip there. But this is uh, practically monotonic sea level rise and uh, has been accelerating over the last uh, 60 years or so. So uh, this is global climate change in action. There is simply no other explanation because the only mechanisms that can make sea level rise are thermal expansion, alpine glacier melt, and ice sheet melt. Those are the only things, and those take heat, and that's what global warming is doing. So um, now here's uh, where I'm going to kind of depart from the uh, rather gloomy, <laughs> rather gloomy uh, 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 litany of horrors that we've been uh, running through this afternoon. Uh, I, what I have found, because I give hundreds of talks like these, and I give them quite often to students. I give them to high school students, middle school students. And, uh, but even, even adults uh, need to hear uh, that there is actually uh, a solution. There's some good news on this. And what I found is that, and, and I think there's psychological data to back this up, if you tell people about a problem and you don't tell them the way forward, they almost literally physiologically cannot hear you. They certainly will not hear you, okay? 
and they're going to go away depressed. They're going to go, you know, they're going to have to go see Carrie Norgar. Are you clinical? You're not clinical, okay? Uh, well, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, they're, you know, it's it's terrible. You know, they're going to have to go take Prozac, and, and it's awful. And so uh, when I started talking about the solutions, uh, which are which are many and which are remarkable and which are which are uh, exploding all around us, but not well covered by the mainstream media, then people are empowered and they get it and they can walk away feeling like, yes, there's, some, there's a future for me, there's a future for my children, we just have to go there. We have to make the right decisions. Now I live in a very conservative community in the state of Michigan in the USA, a small town in Midland, Michigan. It is the headquarters of a Fortune 500 company called Dow Chemical, a very large corporation. And so I, I like to refer to data from Dow Chemical because people can identify with it. But you could use almost any Fortune 500 uh, corporation in the United States and tell the very same story. Uh, Dow Chemical started, uh, they figured out in the 1990s that saving energy saved them money and it was a good idea. And uh, once they started doing that, uh, just as a side benefit, because in the 1990s they didn't believe in this global warming stuff, um, they, they were reducing their greenhouse gas footprint. Now, since then, uh, in the last few years, they've realized climate change is real, and they've made it, uh, they're integrating it into their business plan, and they're really uh, being uh, aggressive on this. And uh, uh, not, not perfect, but they're doing a pretty good job. So they're reducing their global greenhouse gas footprint, and at the same time, what they figured out is, uh, during those years, and this goes up to 2010, they actually added because of the savings, $9 billion to their bottom line. Now, Dow's a big company, but $9 billion is a lot of money. And so that means they can hire more people, they can build more stuff, they can do all the good things that they like to do. And it runs directly counter to this narrative that if we deal with this problem, we will degrade our lifestyles, we'll have to ride donkeys and live in caves, and we won't have computers and cars or fly in airplanes or any of this stuff. It, in fact, we can deal with this problem, we can decrease our greenhouse gas footprint, and we can become more prosperous. We can have a better life for our children. We can have less pollution. We can use technologies that operate with the infinite energy that comes to us from the universe itself instead of these finite te technologies, finite energy sources that we've run on for the last couple of hundred years. So we're using more and more renewable energy in the United States. I know, uh, I, I, you know I apologize for uh, you know, many of my countrymen. Yeah, I get it. You know, we're, we're big and we're bad and, and we're the United States. Okay. but. I want you to know there's a good story about the United States because even though we don't have a, a, a national policy on climate change, the economics of renewable energy is such and the understanding of the climate problem at the state level in particular is growing rapidly. And so we're seeing an expansion in wind energy. This is just about 15 miles from my house, one of the largest uh, installations of wind in, in my state. Uh, a couple hundred megawatts, so there's uh, several hundred of these towers. They're gorgeous, they're beautiful. I'm going out there and shooting pictures all the time. So this is from the regulatory body in my state of Michigan. The, the cost of wind energy as of 2009 and 10, about three years ago, was uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So that is, that's right about on the sweet spot where you want to be if you want to be competitive for electrical energy in the United States. The average is somewhere around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, some states lower, some states higher. But that's right about on the sweet spot. In the last three years, as of this current year, the average price for wind energy is now 5 cents a kilowatt hour. That represents three years worth of experience and, and, and gaining know-how in the industry. We've cut the price in half. And Michigan is not a particularly, it's a fairly good wind state, but it's not one of the best ones. In the best ones out in the Midwest, in the Great Plains, uh, those prices are more like two cents a kilowatt hour. So wind uh, in, in the best wind areas really, uh, I'm sorry, blows away everything uh, uh, in terms of the competition. 
uh, natural gas is the closest thing to a competitor, and I'll discuss why natural gas is not going to remain a competitor. Uh, but here we have a major, major source of renewable energy that uh, is no carbon or very, very low carbon and is absolutely exploding throughout the United States. In fact, Bloomberg News, which is a pretty conservative economic uh, uh, news organ in the United States, is talking about how wind energy is just pummeling, pummeling nuclear power. Uh, it has benefited consumers in regions where wind development is fastest contributing to a 40% power price plunge since 2008. Okay, now that's not necessarily the price that consumers are paying, but it is a, so it is a wholesale price of the big bulk electricity that, that utilities are moving around. So it's having a favorable impact on prices in the United States and becoming more and more competitive day by day by day because the uh, Department of Energy tells us that wind is going to continue to decline in cost as technology improves. Uh, we've got, we're going to see at least another 30% and probably more uh, decline in cost in the very near future for wind. So extremely competitive and we're seeing a uh, huge growth in wind in the United States. Now, solar energy, uh, I, was, I was at a conference of uh, renewable energy uh, experts in Texas and the buzz phrase was, uh, solar is the new wind. Uh, because solar photovoltaic, in particular, is coming on fantastically strong. These are the, the panels that you are, you know, are made of uh, uh, silicon and some of the other uh, semiconductors. The light hits them, and it knocks electrons around, and it creates a current. And these are the ones that you put on your roof, and they generate power. Now, uh, Germany, of course, is the place where this has really been taking off because they have not only great manufacturing skills, but they have policies to really push the development of wind. And not too long ago, on a sunny day in May, uh, Germany received almost 50%, half of its electricity. This is one of the top four manufacturing and exporting nations on the planet got almost half of their electricity from rooftop solar panels. Now, they don't do that every day, and we don't expect them to at this stage, but it gives you an idea of the scope and the scale of the transformation that is happening in Germany, and that is uh, winding up in the United States. It's just about to blow in the United States. Um, and that's why uh, we're starting to see uh, items like this in the Wall Street Journal. Um, utilities facing a mortal threat from solar. The Edison Electric Institute, which is the think tank that electric utilities in the United States all contribute into to uh, have very, very smart people tell them what's going to happen in the future. About six months ago, the, uh, this institute came out with a report that said solar energy is about to crack open and break the model by which utilities have made money for the last 120 years. It's going away. And this has been widely reported in the US financial press. The utilities are aware of this, and it's starting to get them really crazy. Um, so we're seeing this all over, and, and, we're seeing, uh, and at the same time, we're seeing the example of Germany. And so uh, uh, obviously, we're, we're expecting to see a pushback in the disinformation press. Uh, uh, against solar energy, uh, against renewable energy, against uh, uh, renewable technologies, and, uh, and distorting this story uh, about uh, Germany. Because, just to give you an example, uh, it took us globally about 40 years from the invention of uh, photovoltaic power, it took us about 40 years to get to uh, 50 gigawatts globally installed of photovoltaic solar energy. We doubled that in the last two years. And we will double it again by 2015. So we're now on a two-year doubling time for solar photovoltaic globally. And you can relate that to the, the speed at which processors and memory have increased on your computer. And we all know how, that, how transformative that has been. Uh, the, the, probably all of you have a, a device in your pocket which has 
perhaps thousands of times more power than, than a powerful desktop computer would have had 20 years ago. That's the kind of scaling that we're seeing with solar energy right now. And that's why Edison Electric Institute is saying, look out, this is coming, you better get ready because it's not going to stop and it will break your company and make you go away if you don't get ready for it. So we're seeing the pushback from, of course, Fox News. This is the, this is the disinformation organ in uh, uh, the United States. And I'm hoping that the sound works on this. Uh, but you'll hear this lady talking about Germany and what's going on with solar in Germany if the sound works. What was Germany doing correct? Are they just a smaller country and made it more feasible? They're a smaller country and they've got lots of sun, right. right? They've got a lot more sun than we do. Right. So at this point, I pause the presentation and I give a little geography lesson. Uh, okay, here's Germany, a cloudy northern European country on the same latitude as Labrador Canada. And if we look at the graph from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, here's the solar resource in the United States and in Germany. It's color-coded. Okay, red is more, purple is less. Germany gets less sun than almost any place in the United States except way up in the Pacific rainforest here. Even Alaska gets more sun than Germany. Okay, so. Uh, we, we, we expect this from Fox News. We understand uh, you know, that this is what we're going to get. Uh, we're going to see more of it. It's going to get more and more frantic you know, as, as this takes off. Uh, but, but it's an indicator of just how panicky uh, they're starting to get. So here's the, the price of solar uh, photovoltaic uh, as it has dropped from 1977. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, what it's doing there, and, and you know, both Mike and Stefan are scientists, and they uh, continually caution people like me not to just simple-mindedly look at a graph and, and assume that, or, or pretend that you see some kind of a trend there. You know? But I'm going to go out on a limb and say, there's a trend in this graph. Okay. <laughs> And if we look, uh, if we you know, go a little bit closer and look at the last decade or so, here's uh, uh, conventional sources of electric power prices, and here's uh, solar photovoltaic coming down, down, down. And it, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to imagine that uh, somewhere out there, those lines are going to cross. And you can debate, is it two years? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Probably it will be. Uh, a rolling sort of a, a, a transformation starting in the American Southwest where it's really sunny and moving gradually across the rest of the country depending on what kind of policies we adopt. Uh, but that's the change. That's where the change is going to happen. And I relate it to the type of change that we saw when the internet first uh, 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 arrived, exploded on the scene after after 40 years of development where most people were not aware that it was even going on, in 1993, you might have read about it in the paper. You thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, but I can't really justify a computer. By 1995, 96, we were all online for four hours a night checking our email, making our homepage, and blah, blah, blah. And so uh, we're going to see a similar transformation like this simply because the technology is going to become so affordable and so cool and so compelling that we will just not be able to stay away. And it'll start with the big customers like the Walmarts and the big manufacturing concerns and anybody that's got a big parking lot or a flat roof or, or a, a plot of land where they can put solar panels is going to start putting them up. And that's why the utilities are in trouble if they don't adjust. And finally, uh, we've been seeing uh, something that is really stunning a transformation in politics. We've talked about this very, very conservative wing of the Republican Party called the Tea Party. And uh, uh, it turns out that there are some people in that group who are actual conservatives, who actually believe in conservative principles. They don't just hate having a black guy for president. They actually uh, have uh, s some in 
integrity and some principles related to smaller government, uh, rights of individuals, uh, the development of, of, of community as opposed to big corporations, big government, big organizations. And they recognize, they've come to recognize what many of us have been saying for 30 years, with, with, renewable energy is your natural ally because it devolves power away from big government, away from big utilities and big corporations and down to states and counties and villages and communities and small businesses and individuals. And that's just what we want to see because it's democratizing. And it's happening in Germany. And it's empowering people. And that's another reason why the, the, the most powerful people who are funding this pushback are getting even, even more frantic, even more panicky. And so expect to see the, 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 the wheel of disinformation ratchet up even, even more frantically over the next few months. Now, we know that this transformation is making its way down to the grassroots level because on uh, June, uh, late in, in June, this uh, past summer, we saw Barack Obama uh, give a speech on climate change. And this was a historic event. Uh, I happened to be up in Greenland at that moment, and uh, we had a good internet connection, so we were listening to the speech. And uh, this was an absolutely transformative, this was an absolutely uh, 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 a watershed event in American politics, where the president came out very, very forcefully, talked about climate change, and said, we, we must do something about it, we're going to do something about it, and basically put it on the front burner. He didn't do that in a vacuum. He did that because very, very careful polling and focus grouping over the past few years told him and his team that now is the time. People were ready to hear it. Because as loudly as the climate deniers have been speaking, the planet has been speaking even more loudly. And uh, for me, the hinge of history was turned sometime in the summer of 2012. Many of us felt it happen. And uh, if you weren't in the United States, uh, that was a year of, of, of historic extreme weather, the likes of which almost uh, nobody uh, had uh, any memory of. Uh, it, was, it was a time where day by day, by week by week, you could hear people just, just saying, I've never seen anything like this. How much worse is this going to get? Is this, is this climate change? And Anybody that's been seriously involved in this issue for any length of time will tell you that there was a moment when they awakened in the middle of the night, maybe unable to breathe, because they recognized the enormity of what we're doing. And for many people, this moment came in 2012, and it continues to come. So I put together a video based on just random, not random, but carefully selected clips from media <laughs> during the, during, because I have no money, I just got a camera a few months ago. Um, uh, carefully stolen clips from media <laughs> in June and July of, of 2012, while we were in, in, heading into this terrible drought, we were seeing wildfires breaking out all over, terribly destructive weather events happening. This derecho storm moved across the eastern United States, devastating, like a straight line hurricane all the way across the United States. And I put this together for a group of, I was at a conference of environmental journalists. We were right in the middle of the drought area in Michigan. The stream flows were down to 1 and 2 percent locally, and it was just crispy, crispy, dry, and we were at this uh, scientific agricultural center, and, uh, and, and they, you know, here's the guy, you know, he makes these funny videos, come on, let's go, go see this guy, you know, and this is, I'm sorry, it's not a very funny video, uh, I, I, but it, it does kind of capture, I think, what was happening in a lot of people's minds and hearts related to this climate change issue. And I'll just let you, I'll just run it and you can react and tell me what you think.
Here is the video of those wildfires as shot by the external cameras from the International Space Station, monitored by the uh, communications and tracking officer and the uh, Cronus officer here in Mission Control. May 2011 through April 2012 was the warmest 12-month period in the U.S. since 1895, when the government first started keeping records. In tiny Norton, Kansas last week, it hit 118 degrees, hotter than Death Valley. By the way, we had 1,800 record high temperatures in the last seven days. Make it 108, are you kidding me? In Wisconsin, it caused Highway 29 to buckle, sending this SUV flying. The event like we saw on Friday night certainly was very unusual. We'll see smaller scale derecho events that see powerful systems that move across very swiftly, just about mowing down anything in their path. But this particular one covered such a broad area of the Ohio River Valley towards the mid-Atlantic region in a very short period of time, knocking out power to millions of people that have been suffering due to the heat. So they're without power, they don't have water, and it may take a little bit longer for them to have power restored. Tonight, states of emergency remain in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, and D.C. as one to two million people are still without power and suffering through triple-digit heat. We suffered a hurricane uh, impact without the three to four days of hurricane warning. Meteorologists say the heat wave made the storm much more powerful. We've broken 40,000 daily heat records so far this year. That's twice as many as last year. In a normal year, we should have one record high temperature for every record low. So far this year, there's been 10 record highs for each record low. No parallel. You literally meant that? I don't think there has been anything quite like this before. What does this say is going on? Well, I think it's, you know, you look out the window and you see climate change in action. This is the way it gets manifested. One of the predictions is not only does it get warmer, but we see more extreme weather events. Welcome to the rest of our lives. It went for at least 20 minutes. It just pummeled. It was unbelievable. And the rain, there was so much rain. I, it was like, it was like being in a disaster movie. It sounded like the house was exploding. Literally. You know, just... To put all of this into perspective, Hurricane Katrina knocked out power, in some cases for a very long time, to about 3 million people. This storm knocked out power to 5 million people at one point. 108 in St. Louis, many areas above 100. Look at these temperatures. Cities across the country are breaking all-time heat records right now. Deadwood, heat, drought, you get fire. It's all the way down the hill, dude. Look at this. We gotta go. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is crazy. I have never seen anything like this in my life. The animals are freaking out. Our dogs are going nuts. Denise, you've got to see this. Those flames are massive. What's unusual is to see this kind of explosive fire event occur early in the season. Usually this kind of thing will occur later. We always have some wildfires and patches, but we don't expect to see them until much later in the season. And clearly there's going to be an impact. So I'm not, not disputing that increasing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere is going to have an impact. It'll have a warming impact. The, the how large it is, is what is very hard for anyone to predict. And depending on how large it is, then projects how dire the consequences are. This coin we're looking at now, should be, should be eight feet tall. Right now, we've got moderate to severe to extreme drought over a large portion of the grain producing area of the U.S. And what do you want to do to adapt to that? And as human beings, as a, as a, as a species, that's why we're all still here. We have spent our entire existence adapting. Government says the nation's corn crop is in the worst shape since 1988, and it's set prices up more than 35% in just three weeks. And it's only the early part of July. Dave Ibendahl says his southern Illinois farm hasn't seen a decent rain since April 14th. Our corn is just about done for. Uh, I would expect that the yield is going to be 
ridiculously low this year. Changes to weather patterns that move crop production areas around, we'll adapt to that. And the way things are going, it wouldn't be any surprise to me to see a sharp reduction in the American grain harvest because of drought this year. It's an engineering problem, and it has engineering solutions. And People fall back in the face of extreme weather on their own devices, which in places like Kenya and Afghanistan are cheap AK-47s and raiding your neighbor's cattle or turning to the drug trade. We'll adapt to that. And this is just the beginning, this kind of summer weather we're having. Welcome to the rest of our lives. Here you see the trend, the global trend of the number of loss relevant uh, weather extremes and you see that uh, the number has increased from roughly about 400 of these events in the early 1980s to now uh, about 1000 so there's a factor of 2.5, a 2.5 fold increase of the number of these events and if we have a look at the different uh, origins of these events, the atmosphere and the Earth, the geophysical events and the weather-related events, then you see a big difference. The red line uh, shows the trend of the geophysical events and the blue and green, again, uh, the flood and uh, the wind, wind storm or storm events. And you see there is a big uh, difference. You see that they have gone up by far more. And we only can explain this by a change also on the hazard side, which means a change in the frequency and intensity. And as you have seen in the slide before, that we definitely uh, have this. We'll adapt to that. And what we find is that many regions of the globe are likely to uh, experience this permanent emergence of extreme heat uh, over the next four to five decades. And in fact, in the tropics, we find that there's a 50% likelihood uh, in, in many areas that this extreme heat emergence could occur within the next two decades. We'll adapt to that. Outside of the tropics, uh, areas of the United States, particularly in the western United States and along the eastern seaboard, uh, are at risk of, of experience this, experiencing this permanent uh, extreme heat emergence um, within the next uh, four to five decades. We also find that substantial areas of Europe and China uh, uh, face this extreme heat emergence uh, over the next half century. I didn't expect to see changes that were this large. Uh, we're looking at what has been a very rare event for our common experience uh, becoming a, a common event uh, in the relatively near-term future. And what do you want to do to adapt to that? Welcome to the rest of our lives.